When dealing with a falsehood, you're faced with two options. You can accept it or you can reject it. The basis upon which we take one of these actions is a product of our critical thinking capabilities and a desire to know what is true instead of confirming our bias. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. On Brainstorm, we choose the hard truths over the comforting lies. Reason, compassion, skepticism, this is the Brainstorming Podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Brainstorm Podcast, Skeptic Studio, the interview portion of the Brainstorm Podcast, where we talk to a variety of folks with the intent to spread critical thinking, compassion, and skepticism. I'm Corey, and my panel tonight are Lisa. Hi there. Renee. Hello. And the always amazing Dave. I'm going to be amazing. I hope. I hope. <laughs> yeah. We're broadcasting live from Roman Empire Studios in Regina, Saskatchewan, and today is October 26, 2018. Tonight's guest is Dr. Jillian Scudder, author, blogger, and assistant professor at Oberlin College. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I guess a good place to start is uh, a bit of your background. <laughs> <laughs> How far back do you want to go? <laughs> uh, when you started going to school with Lisa, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's grad school. Um So yeah, uh, Lisa and I were both (laughs) at the University of Victoria for our graduate degrees, um, and we were in the same office, so she was behind me and diagonally. Um, Can you imagine how she (laughs) suffered? (laughs) Like, it's not even funny. (laughs) It was, it was a, it was a lively office for the most part. We had the chattiest office, I think, down the whole corridor. (laughs) That's hard Um, to imagine. (laughs) Jillian was trying to get shit done. (laughs) (laughs) I got really good at like nose down in my own work, uh, if I needed to. Um, but then usually like three to four o'clock was not a productive time for anybody. Just that was everyone's <laughs> brain dead time. So we just sort of stopped and like chatted about random stuff. And then we could think about whether or not we wanted to do an hour of work at the end of the day or not. Um, so, yeah, cool. that was a, a five year period of trying to do astronomy um, and bashing our heads <laughs> against various things that weren't working. Um, what got you interested in astronomy? Uh, I kind of fell into it by accident, honestly. Um, I wanted to do some kind of science. I liked astronomy, but I was unaware that it was a career. Um, (laughs) honestly, until like the third year of undergraduate, I was unclear that you could be paid to do astronomy all the time. Um, and that was about the time where I was like, oh, maybe I could go to grad school. Um, and so I sort of fell into physics on accident. And then I was like, oh, actually, maybe I don't want to take lab instrumentation. So maybe I'll do astronomy. Um, and, oh, I guess I could keep doing astronomy. That's a thing that I could do. Um, and so I just wound <laughs> up continuing until there was nothing else I could do. I was like, oh, I'm done with all possible schooling. I better get a job. <laughs> at a school. <laughs> yes, at a school. <laughs> I'm overqualified for everything. Um, so after UVic, I went on and I did a postdoc at the University of Sussex, which is on the south coast of uh, the UK um, in lovely Brighton. Uh, and I was there for three years doing more astronomy. Um, and at the end of that time, I went, right, should get another job and um, (laughs) managed to find a position as a, as a faculty member in Ohio. And I have been there for a little over a year now. Okay. Fun. So what got you blogging? Ah, that was my intense dislike of the passive voice. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) pretty straightforward answer. (laughs) 
Yeah, well, I mean, grad school, you start writing science papers all the time. And science papers are very dry and very passive voicey, and you don't get to be excited about what you're doing very much. Um, and I was coming from a liberal arts background where I had done a lot of writing. Um, and I felt like if I wasn't going to practice another form of writing, I was just going to become terrible at it. <laughs> and I didn't like the idea of becoming terrible at writing uh, in a non-scientific context. And so I decided I should try something else. And blogging seemed like a good way of writing about something that I cared about. Um, and so I just set up a quiet blog in a corner and tried to test out the waters and see how it would go. Um, and eventually it started going reasonably well. And so I was like, all right, okay, I'll keep doing this. How long have you been blogging actually? Uh, About five and a half years now. It's long enough. (laughs) Yeah, it's been a while. (laughs) And you're mostly blogging about science? It's all astronomy, almost entirely. Right. So they're all questions that people send in to me. Um, they're usually anonymously submitted. Some people put their names on them, but most of the time they're anonymous. They're just a question. Um, and then I just do my best to answer them as best I can. And I set up the blog that way because I didn't want to have to think up what I should write about. Um, and so it seemed more interesting to figure out what other people would like to hear about and then write about those things. It, yeah, I suppose it is pretty tough. Like when you sit down to write and you're like, okay, so I'm going to write something. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you never really yeah. know what people are going to be interested in. I find that if you're an expert in something like astronomy, it's hard to know what people would ask because like you just there's assumptions you make, like you just know things right. and you and you don't realize. Oh, I, I've I've not thought that people might ask <laughs> this fundamental thing that you know seems right. obvious to me or that you know I don't think about anymore. But oftentimes right. the most basic questions actually can be. I don't know. I don't know if you, maybe I'll ask you this, put this on you. Do you not find that the most basic questions can really make you think and, and be like, oh yeah, why do I believe that? Or why, why, why do we think that's the case? Or sometimes it's, it's the, um, the basic questions are tricky to explain in a way that doesn't sound like you're reciting something that you've heard before. Mm. Uh, it's not that I don't understand it, but that there's a very sort of rote answer that you hear a lot. So, mm. Um, a good example of this is that I have a lot of people visiting an, a blog article that I wrote a long time ago, which was on why do we only see one side of the moon? <laughs> and okay. the sort of pat answer is, oh, well, because the moon goes around this, the earth and it orbits at a certain with a certain time and it rotates at that same time. And so that's why you only see one side of the moon, but that's clearly not doing it for people. Like in terms of an explanation, that's not enough to get the, yeah, but why? Well, why does the, yeah. Why does the moon rotate with the same period as it orbits? Yeah. And so trying to dig into that to be like, right. Okay. Well, I assume that they've heard that that's the reason before but trying to dig more into the okay, but why does it why is it in that configuration? Why does it why is it still there after so many years? Um, that's a trickier thing to try and dig into. Well, don't leave us in suspense. What's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got ah, it's like I said, it's tricky. Um, so you've got um, the gravitational force between the Earth and the Moon, and the distances, bet- the distance between the Earth and the Moon is large, but the distance between the Earth and the near side of the Moon is smaller than the distance between the Earth and the far side of the Moon. So the gravitational force between the Earth and the near side is stronger than the Earth and the far side. And so mm-hmm. there's this resistance to, um, turning that comes into play 
And once that resistance to turning comes in, then it's a very stable um, configuration to leave one side always facing the same, always facing the Earth, because that gravitational pull is stronger there. Um, and conversely, it's weaker on the far side, so it's not as attracted to the Earth. So you get this tidal locking out of this just a little bit of extra distance from the other side of the moon. Um, and that, in combination with the orbit of the moon, is why you get only one side facing the Earth. So how much, I'm kind of thinking, how many, how much of this do you know offhand? Like, when, when we, at least when we were working together, your specialty was in extragalactic astronomy, uh, higher redshift stuff. So, I mean, don't, I don't, I mean, I know that the moon orbits at the same um, period as it, as it rotates, but I don't, I had no, I had never spent any brain cells thinking about why or, and I certainly <laughs> wouldn't know that offhand. So like, as an example, like how, like, yeah, you must get asked questions across I mean, astronomy can be a very specialized field. So mm. how much of this, how much research do you have to do for this stuff? I guess I usually have to do a fair amount. Okay. Um, it, it's sort of, it depends on what the question is, but sometimes I wind up digging really deep to try and find an answer. Mm. Um, and other times it's sort of an, Oh, I should just check on some numbers, but I do know this offhand. Um, let me just double check that these things are correct. Or let me find a graph that illustrates this, but, um, it depends, but I would say that the the majority of the questions I don't actually know the answers to, and I would have to go check it. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes I can pick up the answers pretty quickly, where like it'll be a question, and I'll just sort of go, mm, yeah, I don't remember exactly how that works with that, but I know it depends on these things, so let me go double check. And sometimes I have to sit down and work out a bunch of math, um, mm-hmm. because it's not, it's like a hypothetical question that no one's worked out before, because why would they? Um, Mm. and sometimes it's really like, oh, I don't know, uh, where in the sun would a human become neutrally buoyant? Why would I know that? I don't know, but I had to go look it up one time. (laughs) (laughs) Seems like an interesting question. It was, yeah, that question, (laughs) it's, it's about a third of the way down from what I remember. Whoa. Uh, Someone wanted to know if you could surf the sun. Assuming that you didn't burn up. Mm, yeah, that would be an important assumption. And yeah, so <laughs> the, you have to assume that you wouldn't burn up because that would be the first thing that would happen. But then yeah. I was trying to figure out how far down you would sink. One of, I, love these kind of th- I love these kind of questions. One of my favorite XKCD, it's not a comic, but it's a blog post. It's about talking about where you would get a fatal dose of radiation from neutrinos from a supernova. Because mm. cause neutrinos hardly ever interact, right? But they do interact once in a while. And right. a supernova makes so many neutrinos that even though, you know, we have whatever it is, billions of neutrinos going through our bodies right now and we're not getting really any radiation dose from it. If you look at a supernova, it's got so many neutrinos, you could be like, I think the answer was like basically the distance, like one AU ish from a, from a supernova and you could get a fatal dose of radiation. But you, of course, you'd get a fatal dose of radiation from all the other stuff, right? And you'd be dead. Yeah. From the explosion. Right. But if that didn't happen, the neutrinos <laughs> would kill you. <laughs> and you'd have a great view while you died. Yeah. Well, no, you'd die slowly too, cause, it, like, cause, cause they were looking at like four gray, which kills you in like three weeks. Like it's oh. not even- <laughs> Anyway, it was, stupid. but I love that kind of shit. Like, it makes me so happy. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, there's some really good ones like that where I just wind up in the weird parts of the internet, like, right, okay. Um, I'm sorry to the, like, NSA agent who's watching my search history, but, like, I do need to know this right now for, I promise, science. <laughs> I'm sure the NSA agents see all sorts of weird shit. Like, I'm sure. Want to know. <laughs> I don't even want to know. So are you, um, at Oberlin, are you primarily, are you doing a lot of research? Are you primarily teaching? Are you, like you, you said, you're at a conference about teaching physics now. So Yeah. So in principle, it's a balance between teaching and research. Um, so they're, they're really keen to have undergraduate students involved in like actual progress of science research. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still getting my legs under me because it is the start of my second year. Um, mm. And I was not supervising any students last year as part of the like on-ramp to 
doing professor things. Um, so over the summer, I had a couple of students and I'm sort of gearing up to have a few more students working with me soon. But um, I am trying to keep my own research active also. Um, but during the semester, it's pretty busy with teaching stuff so far. So I think in the future, it will balance a little differently. But right now, I'm still learning how to do stuff. So, so when so. things even out for you, what are you interested in? Like what, what I mean... Broadly speaking, what areas are you are you planning on studying? I am so I'm still doing uh, a lot of work on um, really highly star forming galaxies, other than our own. And um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is this new survey called Manga, um, which takes uh, galaxies that are relatively nearby, so that we can see them in some level of detail on the sky. Um, and where we're used to having a single spectrum of light at the center of the galaxy and then maybe an image of the rest of the galaxy, we're going to get, or we are getting, um, up to like 150 spectra or 130 spectra across the galaxy. And so we have way more detail about what the galaxy is doing than we've ever had to deal with before. So on the one hand, the data is awesome and it looks great. Um, on the other hand, it's way more complicated than we've ever had to deal with before. So part of trying to figure out what to do with this data is like, well, how do I look at 2,000 galaxies that all have detailed information across the whole galaxy? Because um, you could look at any one of them individually and get a lot of interesting information, but... I can't look at 2,000 galaxies in an efficient manner. So how do I compress that without losing information that I care about? What telescope are you guys doing this with? Uh, it's on the Sloan telescope. So okay. it's in um, it's the new Sloan Digital Sky Survey Project. Um, so it's publicly available after one year. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when I'm starting to play with it. I have collaborators in the survey group. Um, but, uh, I get to play with it after it has been processed a little bit. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really cool data. I'm excited to play with it. Um, and I'm working also with, uh, a bunch of radio data, um, which is just as annoying as I remember it being in grad school. Um, but there's some cool stuff in there too. So lots of cool galaxy stuff and mostly smash ups, which are still my favorite. Smash ups? Yeah, when they smash into each other. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Does that mean literally? <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed, when they smash into each other. So for our layperson audience, what what can you glean from spectra of a galaxy? Maybe explain maybe what a spect- spectrum is and then sure. what what can we learn from that? So the spectrum of light that you get is basically if you took a beam of light that uh, came from the galaxy and you put it through a prism the way that you can put any white light through a prism and break it up into its individual colors. Um, But very carefully, um, that's your spectrum is what the individual breakdown of what, how much of what color of light is coming from a galaxy. And you can learn a lot from that spectrum. Um, the things that I'm interested in particularly that you can get out of there is um, how many stars are being formed in that patch of the galaxy. So the bluer the light that you get out of that bit of the galaxy, the more new stars are being formed. Um, and you can also learn a lot about what kind of elements are in the gas in that galaxy. So um, you can see either by the colors that are glowing there or the colors of light that are missing out of the light that you receive, what things are um, present in the data, what elements are present in that patch of the galaxy. And if it changes over the face of the galaxy, then you're really seeing weird things happening internal to that galaxy that you wouldn't have um, information about if you didn't have that spectrum. 
So it's a really detailed and fine-toothed way of inspecting the light from a galaxy and pulling out um, information that is interesting. The other things you can get out is sort of how old the stars are. Um, You can learn a lot about um, the motion of the galaxy, how it's moving, how it's rotating. Um, Hmm. There's a lot of information that you get out of it. It's really fun. I have no, uh, I, this I, is where you guys have to ask because I don't know what you're talking about, but I, I don't know. know. Is, is there some of this words? I'm like, <laughs> I, I recognize that word. Yeah. Like I'm sorry. I don't realize. totally understand it, but I recognize it. All I right, don't so even which, know enough. To, which, to, which one, where did I lose you? <laughs> the, no. <laughs> Pretty, yeah. Kind of about there. No, most of it, most of it, I, I kind of understood, but very surface understanding. Well, that's, that's where you start. That's yeah. where everyone starts. Is there something you'd like me to go into in more detail? <laughs> now my brain just stopped. <laughs> just froze. <laughs> so I guess a good this would be a good place to ask about your book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> when in doubt, change the topic. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I'm sorry that I lost you all. <laughs> No, that that's our fault for. Uh, well, like not- said, I said, w- I wasn't <laughs> lost. It's just kind of that surface yeah. understanding because I've watched a lot of those kind of on Netflix, the like mm. deep astrology stuff, and I'm like, oh, this is all interesting, but it's just kind of surface understanding, right? Yeah, it's um, but the surface understanding is important, also, um, and it is difficult to. Especially when you're talking about something like a spectrum, which is a, a fairly technical aspect of astronomy. Um, but especially when you're talking about something like a spectrum in audio only format. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no visual aids yeah. to help you whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so like the idea of a spectrum is basically your rainbow, right? Yeah. So if, if you give you pure white light, then that's telling me that I'm blending the visible colors evenly. And if I take um, a laser and I take a spectrum of a laser lasers are only one color of light so I, I, I break that light up and I get only green or only red or only purple if you're being really fancy with your laser pointers um, but most things in the universe give you several different colors of light um, and so if you look at a galaxy and it's mostly blue light then that tells you that it's forming uh, a lot of new stars because you have to have the newest stars to make blue light um, because they only, the stars that make blue light only live a short time. So if you see them at all, then they must have been formed recently. Because and, blue light is hotter <laughs> light. New oh. stars are hot. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, you, and yeah, you can get velocity information from spectra, how fast, like, you know, like, um, like how a train is moving towards you, goes and then it goes away from you, goes right, right. That's that's a, a red, sh- a blue shift, and a red shift of of the sound waves. Okay. The light waves, like like the light from the galaxies, will also be shifted, blue shift or red shift, and that can give tells you how they're moving relative to you. Oh, yeah, yeah. you can see that. That's interesting. I'm looking at waves on my computer right now, so I, I understand. That's it. a good thing to be doing. <laughs> um, in, yeah. I'm, so, so, so you ask to hear these guys. I'm like, I'm, what, what, which star forming model are you using? Whose model are you? Because <laughs> I've been out of the field for like five years or something. What's going on with that? Like, did, is everyone still using so and so's? Like, <laughs> what are, are these? Like, pretty, is, sorry, go ahead. This is the other tricky thing: is that I'm talking to Lisa and I'm talking to other people. So. Yeah. Well, but our audience is not me, so we should no. probably like, not nerd out on this podcast. <laughs> Um, but I think it's also good because, um, you know, we often talk about science and what do scientists say and what, you know, but this is like the process as it really is. And this is how scientists, how they really talk. And, and there's no like grand conspiracy to like fake climate change, right? It's just right. like a bunch of nerds going, Oh, oh redshift. Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> Sitting around doing yeah, technical talk. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I, I hey, think it's, it's nice to see. Yeah, it's like, hey, look, this data is so complicated and messy. It's amazing. What am I going to do with it? 
I have well, no you know, idea. I just, <laughs> we just recently had a present a public lecture by uh, Vicky Caspi. Do you know her? No. She's a McGill prof and she does um, hmm. fast radio bursts. And oh, the whole okay. talk was about how we have no idea what these fast radio bursts are. And, and she was, <laughs> the whole thing was about that. And it was just so fascinating. And you're like, how we have no idea and how we know it's not this and how we know we know it's not that. Anyway, it was, it was really interesting. So, um, yeah. So it was just a reminder of how cool science can be when you don't know um, yeah. what the answer is, which is good. It is something that we all, I think, delight in is like, hey, I saw something really weird. Um, I don't know what it is, and I'm super pumped about it. Right. Cause this, is, this is just a, a thing that our brains do. We're like, hey, did you see this? I have no idea what that is. Oh, no one has any idea what that is. Oh. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> that seems to be happening a lot lately in the, in your field. Like I've, I've noticed a lot of articles like that where they're like, oh, what's this thing in the distance uh, with this pulsing wave or whatever? Like I, I don't know the technical terms, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, like it's like it seems like you guys are getting excited a lot lately, which is good. <laughs> I mean, yeah. science is all about things you don't know. I mean, we don't know what like makes up what is it eighty percent of the energy fraction of the universe? Like, or, like 70, we don't know 70, what dark energy is. It's like seventy two percent of the seventy two. Sorry, seventy two. Yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> not eighty. But, but is that, you know but, what I mean. Like, but like 95% of the universe, we just don't understand if you count dark matter. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> we just. I know enough to know that. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. I, I heard a, I heard a smart person say it once. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, one of our listeners, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's still true. Our, <laughs> yeah. One of our listeners wants to, uh, wanted me to ask about the Fermi paradox. Fermi paradox. Is this the study um, that there's no, we don't see other intelligent uh, oh, yeah, beings right. out in the universe? I think so. Okay. Then I know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He just put Fermi paradox question mark in the chat room. So, uh, I think <laughs> so. generally, so the general explanation or the general description of this that I, as I understand it, is that, um, we don't see other intelligent, uh, life forms out in the universe. So maybe they've all blown themselves up. And that's why we don't see them. So when we, when we would teach, we had a lab in first, that we'd teach as grad students to the first year undergraduates in astronomy. And we would usually frame it, um, relative to something called the Drake equation. Yeah. So Drake was a, uh, an astor- is he, Drake. he's not dead, is he? No. No, he's not. Anyways, yeah. He's a dude who is famous kind of, one of the kind of pioneers of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, so a real astronomer. And he kind of, yeah, he, he kind of created an equation that's, it's, it, it, it's less of an equation that you throw numbers in and get a, you know, a really reasonable number out of than almost like a discussion point. So he, mm-hmm. he starts with the number of stars in the galaxy. Multiply that by the number of planets per stars and, uh, that are habitable. Then multiply that by, you know, so he kind of goes through and, and does, and it kind of gets, so the number, it gets like from something that's very easy to quantify, like number of stars in the galaxy, and then all the way down to probability that, a, or, or lifetime of a civilization before you nuke, nuke yourself or whatever sort of yeah. thing. And, and, you know, how long will the aliens survive? Before they develop technology that will decimate themselves, or some sort of thing, like or how yeah. long does okay. a civilization survive? So it's, it kind of runs the gambit, and then you can kind of frame a discussion around that. You can throw numbers into the equation, depending on what numbers you put in, you get wildly different answers for the number right. of alien civilizations we can communicate with. But which was always a super fun thing, and at some point yeah. you had to like we got the students to do this, and then at some point they had to start justifying their numbers, right? Because one of the things <laughs> you had to put in was of the planets with life on them. What fraction of them become intelligent where we have basically no baseline to operate on except for what we want to count as intelligent life on Earth. And so then you'd have some planets would be like, or some, some students would say, well, like, I'm fine with the radio, like, you have to be able to build a radio telescope definition of intelligence, um, which humans hit quite late. Um, and then other students would be like, no, I think, uh, birds are intelligent. And you go, okay, well, but dinosaurs were what became birds. So are you wanting a dinosaur planet? And some students would be like, yes, dinosaur planet. I am happy with <laughs> yes. a dinosaur planet. And other students wanted really strict definitions. And then you'd get anywhere from, 
And, you know, um, you should expect one civilization every four galaxies to, you know, there should be uh, tens of thousands in our galaxy. And then you compare that to the distance between stars and the galaxy and whether or not you'd be able to communicate within one civilization's lifetime. And generally the answer, even if you had tens of thousands in one galaxy, was no. Civilizations, <laughs> civilizations last a short time and the galaxy is huge, so... I think I'm thinking there's uh we could question whether or not we have intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> right. I, mean, you, I mean we elected not we but your people elected President Trump so I mean how intelligent can we be? I mean I was going to say flat earthers. <laughs> <laughs> also Trump voters. Uh, <laughs> no. Fair enough. A lot of overlap there in those Venn diagrams. <laughs> Sorry. Um <laughs> I guess, you know, sorry, this is a random total tangent here, but if you're teaching in Ohio, yes, you can't necessarily make little quips about Trump and expect your class to be like, oh yes, he's an idiot. You know, there, there, he's got supporters there. He does, but not so much at my institution. Um, okay. So you can make, you can mock Trump without too much difficulty there. Well, uh, I try not to in general, um, mm. but just as a personal stance, I mm. try not to do that in classes no unless politics. it's really like relevant to <laughs> what is happening in class discussion. Um, so there's but, not a lot of crossover between politics and and space. Um, well, there is there is more of it recently because space of force. the space, space force. force. Yeah. Ah, yes. Um, but there so always is, is because. So, like astronomy, for example, is funded by typically by public money, mm. right? So yeah, it's, but it's um, less a, less about one party's political desires at that point. Um, there's a there's like a large amount of military funding for um, things going into space, and there's definitely like public funding and taxpayer funding for a lot of telescopes that are. Out, currently operating. Um, but I think things like Hubble have pretty broad non-political support because people like seeing pictures of the universe regardless of their politics. Um, I feel like the Space Force is uniquely... Um, <laughs> it, it is a unique thing to propose because it does feel more... Um, partisan in right. terms of its goals and who is in support of it as an idea. Um, it's not like something that came up from the scientific community and was proposed to Congress and Congress then agreed to spend money on. This is something coming the other direction. I don't know. I, I when I, when we were in grad school together, there there was like Stephen Harper was the prime minister of Canada mm. and I, I felt a strong presence of politics and, and political ideology. And it just, I, I could, I felt like I observed the shift in, in, in how the national research council where I worked um, in Victoria was funded. Um, yeah. There was a period where like suddenly like everyone was all up in arms because shit like the, the government said we can't speak to the press like I can't talk to the press about my discovery of a galaxy without getting it through their press person well, you know the, the level of control um, over right. over staff astronomers for example I mean and that right. seemed very political at the time yeah that, and, that I think was quite political um, very geared towards climate change denial almost eh well, well that was just <laughs> the time during which they were closing down the Arctic research stations so um, it was they were closed, libraries. They closed down the library at where we like, in Victoria. There at the observatory and, and elsewhere, and other National Research Council labs. So, mm-hmm. um, as an ex- I don't yeah. know, but there it were was, there was also a lot of backlash against those policies. Like people started to make it known that that was happening, um, and then there, there were articles and things coming out, and it'd be like, why is this a thing that we're doing? Um, why is this a thing that the government is doing? Um, so yeah, there is, there is an intrinsic level of politics that is sort of more or less intrusive depending on who's in charge. A little bit of a change of topic, but do you uh, have trouble watching science fiction movies? 
because of your knowledge of the way things are supposed to work in space? <laughs> mm, it depends on the movie. <laughs> So, like, some movies I can just sit and enjoy, and, like, I particularly enjoyed The Martian. Watching that one was good. I love that movie! (laughs) Especially because he talks to himself the way that scientists (laughs) talk to themselves. Like, the moment in the movie was like, yeah, I screwed up because I'm an idiot. I just laughed so hard because I was like, that, that's what we would say. Like, (laughs) you screw something up for a dumb reason. You're like, and I did this complicated thing wrong because I'm an idiot. And you're like, <laughs> you're not actually an idiot, but that's how you feel in that moment. So um, that was also like a super well researched book slash movie, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I learned something. Like, I remember watching, like he got the, he got the heater from this, where there was a space probe and it was like a, it was like a, mm-hmm. it was based on nuclear decay and he used it to heat his little pod and he wanted, and I remember looking at me like, that's stupid because in like, so I'm working in, in radiation therapy physics now and mm. th- at the, at the levels of radiation we're giving, nothing heats up. Like you, you gain, <laughs> you easily gain a million times more energy from heat by drinking a cup of coffee than by being zapped with our linear accelerators. However, it actually, so I was like, that's stupid, but I looked up, oh yeah, no, NASA actually does use these heaters to heat their probes. This is actually what they use to heat their electronics, is they use um, they use nuclear decay of, of a radioactive substance. That's something that's very, 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 very hot. I mean, radioactive. Mm. Um, and it actually heats up the material around it. They use it as a heater. It's actually true. Like they, mm. So I, I had no idea and I, I totally <laughs> learned something there. So, um, yeah, like it's, it, it, was, it was a very cool, well-researched movie. I, I liked Inter- Interstellar too. Um, I enjoyed that. It wasn't, obviously it wasn't Totally, <laughs> you know, science based. But you know, they, they they I knew that they worked with Kip Thorne on that. Yes. And they they had some really cool um, general relativity um, interpretations in there, which I thought was really really neat. So yeah, I, don't know, I get excited about movies like right? that myself. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I really liked the like. Yeah, I thought Interstellar had really good visuals, and it was a really good way of getting the concepts of general relativity out. Yeah. Um, and I did see after that movie came out, I had a number of people write into the blog and be like, hey, does that work? Is that really how that goes? Um, right. And I could write back and be like, yeah, time dilation does work like that. That's And like, yeah, they did a good job. So your blog is affiliated with Forbes. Is that right? It was. Um, it was. Not anymore. It, it is not anymore. Um, okay. it, I was a Forbes contributor for um, about two years. Okay. So during that time, I was writing uh, blog posts for Forbes, um, and uh, since March, it's just been on its own again. Mm. And so they they so. kind of picked it up at one point, and then you guys parted ways. Yeah. So I was um, I was in contact with some other people, and um, one of them made a transition into writing for Forbes and invited me. Um, okay. along with them. And so I got in touch via that other person. Um, and then after about two years, um, it was also when I was starting uh, my position at, right. at Oberlin. And so I was um, a little bit heavier on the workload than right. I had been before. So I was like, it was a it good was time changed. to, yeah. Yeah. Is, am I crazy? Sorry. I don't remember. Was there a, a book associated with your blog? There is a book associated okay, with that book. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that is a thing that happened. Tell us uh, about your book. So the book basically took the first three years of material that I wrote about um, and uh, organized it more coherently, and then I rewrote the whole thing to be um, a smoother read. Wow. Uh, but it's basically all the content that people were asking about in that first three year period. Um, so we managed to go from things you can see from the ground on earth to, um, a little mini tour of the solar system. We don't hit all the planets cause it turns out not everyone is curious about all the planets. Um, which one don't they care about? Um, <laughs> There, there, I had no questions. We know it's about not it. Uranus. We know it's not Uranus. It Mercury, was actually. I had no questions about it. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. It's everyone's favorite joke. Yeah, but then they don't want to know anything else about it, apparently. Um, Weird. Yeah, so I had lots of questions. I had questions about Mars, Jupiter, um, and uh, Pluto. It was a weird sampling of the solar system. 
Why do you uh, think Mercury's boring, Corey? <laughs> I'm actually offended on Mercury's. They just literally this week, the, what was it? The, it was a, ja- a Japanese European, um, yeah. co- coaching thing Columbo. just sent a, yeah, a new satellite to, to study Mercury. Mercury's cool, damn it. <laughs> just fake. Mercury, one. Mercury's a fun. <laughs> yeah, I was wrong with place. you. I'm offended on Mercury's behalf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mercury's boring. Uh, no, no, it's not. It's like this really. You're just trying to get my. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Mercury has Mercury has land on it that is officially called the weird terrain, and if you don't love that, then I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> that is pretty cool. Yeah. Oh sure, believe Jillian. <laughs> <laughs> Take the word of the guest over the panelist. Eh? Uh, it's, it's generally a good idea to believe things Jillian says, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. And then where did we go from there? We had the solar system, and so then we talked more about the galaxy and the structure of our Milky Way. And then from there, we went to oh, and then we did stars in before, before we got to the Milky Way. So, our sun as a star, and then other suns as um, their own stars, and how we can tell them apart, and what we can learn from them. And then the galaxy, and then other galaxies, and then what we've learned about the structure and the way that the structure of the universe and the way that galaxies relate to each other. Um, and we stopped there. So it was a pretty comprehensive tour of the universe that I was asked about in my first three years of writing. So I'm almost to another book at this rate with two more years of writing after that. <laughs> so. Oh man! So, how much work is it to do like, to write a book to change a blog? Like that sounds like a ton of work. Like, that sounds like doing a po- you know you're working on a postdoc and yeah, also doing that just sounds like insane. It was a lot of work. Yeah. Um, when I was in the early stages of sitting down and sorting it all and deleting the bits that were repetitive, because with an individual article, you have to define all your terms in that article. But with a book, Mm. you only need to define it once. And so it's like, oh, yeah, I wrote about what a black hole is six times, and I only need it once because people are going to read it in order this time. Yeah. Um, You don't want to piss off your audience by, like, continuously (laughs) explaining what a black hole is over and over again. Yeah, like, as we said three pages ago, a black hole... um, so while I was doing this, that I went might, to this. Uh, that wouldn't so, hurt if I was reading it. <laughs> that might be a good thing. It might help. <laughs> um, but I went to this workshop on writing books um, that came to the University of Sussex, and I went th- and I was listening to people talk. And at some point, the speaker went, "Do you do you all realize how much work it is to write a book?" And someone responded with, "A lot." And that guy just goes, it doesn't matter how much work you think writing a book is, it is more work than that. And I already had a sense that it was going to be a lot of work. And he was right. It was more work than I thought it was. Because I wound up rewriting the whole thing twice. Um, Oh, jeez. Because I I wrote it, like I had text written already, and I rewrote it. And then I looked at it, and I sent some of it to my editor, and... He was sort of like, yeah, this isn't quite where it needs to be. And I was like, yeah, that's what I thought. And so then I tried rewriting a sample bit of it um, and sent that over. And I was like, is this better? This feels better. It's like, yeah, that is better. And so I just rewrote the whole thing again. Um, and it was better. Uh, but I did wind up rewriting all the text basically twice entirely did after you- having written it once. <laughs> Did you so? Did you like get a publisher to agree to the, to create the book like based on the blog before you started writing the book, or would you just jump into it and figure it? I'll find a publisher later. Um. So I think I had basically decided that I would like to write a book, and so as part of the pitching process, you have to produce um, a couple of sample chapters. Oh, okay. And so to do that, I had kind of pulled all the information, all the writing off the blog. And like assembled it into a rough structure, but it changed a lot since between that initial pitch and the like final agreement that we made of like, here's what it should look like when it's done. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it was in that sort of window where I had like assembled it and I had a general sense of the volume of information that could be put in. Mm -hmm. Um, But then it was a negotiation with the publisher to um, 
of like what they thought would work well as far as structure and um, like metaphors to hold it all together. Uh, so the, 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 the combination of those yeah. worked together. <laughs> Sorry, I was actually I was just asking, is your book out yet or? Oh yeah, it's out. Um, cool. I didn't hear the, the first part of the question. No, no, sorry. sorry. I think you had a bit of a connection issue. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's, it came out in hardback um, in Canada, I think, at the end of June. Um, cool. And there will be a paperback version coming, I think, uh, this upcoming June. Oh, wow. Uh, to coordinate with the anniversary of the moon landing, which will be cool. Awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it. I'm going to pick it up. <laughs> it's I'm got probably, pretty pictures in it. on the internet. I won't, but <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll pick it up Amazon. when it comes, when it gets here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds like it would make a great Christmas gift. <laughs> there you go. I'm, I'm biased and should not comment, but yes, it is a great Christmas <laughs> present. <laughs> it's full of very pretty pictures. I like to do a, a thing where we, when we have authors on, that I will hmm. buy a copy of the book for the first listener who emails me. Okay. That they want one, so I will do that. Can I email you? You cannot. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, I'll buy my own. You're going to get two orders for your book from this podcast, at least. Excellent. <laughs> I celebrate I, every copy. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's, it's just really... I, I, I don't know. I'm just, I get excited when people, you know, who I knew and they were only students, like, you know, you're, you're doing so well and you're, you're so accomplished. And I just really, I'm so proud of you, Jillian. Like, yeah. <laughs> wow. It's just awesome. Just awesome. It's fun. I'm still like every so often I like pick up my copy and I like look at it and hold it. And I'm like, wow, this is a physical object that contains all my words. Like yeah. I wrote all of those. <laughs> I do that with my PhD thesis sometimes. And I'm like, oh, this is boring. I'm going to put this back <laughs> on the shelf. <laughs> There's too many graphs. <laughs> yeah, whereas this one is much more, like my, my writing style is, I try to keep it pretty conversational. So I sort of open it up and I look at it and I go, yeah, that looks like a thing I would have said. Okay. <laughs> like, I don't yeah, remember I writing your- that, but. I've read several several of your blog posts, and yeah, they are they're very very accessible the way they're written, very engaging. Hmm. That's good. Goal achieved. <laughs> right. Yeah, as long as your audience has a PhD to strive, they <laughs> I totally understand what you're talking about. But I don't know that I'm your really your. Uh... I, I did enjoy the blog post on uh, whether or not you could have two sons. Oh yeah, like like, 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 like sons Tatooine. in our solar system. Oh, like oh, and have that. A habitable planet. Yeah. Can you, Jillian? You can, but there are way more <laughs> ways for it to go wrong than that for that to go right. Interesting. Yes. So, and it depends on how big. <laughs> it depends on a lot of things. So, you need the stars to be in the right orbit. If the stars are too far apart, then your planet has to be really far away. Otherwise, it's going to wind up getting thrown out of your little solar system, which is generally not good for continuing to be habitable. Mm. Um, <laughs> and then if the stars are are too close together, then they're likely to interact with each other, and then their orbits will change as they do that. And then the mm. planet has to respond to a large amount of mass near it also changing rapidly, and that also is a good way of getting thrown out of your solar system. Um, so you have to have everything at kind of the magic distance for things to continue to work, but it can work. So we should be uh, grateful we don't have a binary star system. Right. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Or we wouldn't be around to be grateful for it, I think. Fair That's enough. Probably where it, how that would wind up. <laughs> yes. I see what you're saying. <laughs> it just it strikes me that you're you're just like a really a unique like you like I said, astronomy is so specialized and to the point that like I don't know anything about what's going on, you know, like with I don't know exactly what my Whatever the person the desk desk next to me is doing, and I don't, you know, I'm only the expert in the, my one little narrow field, and there's only like maybe 75 other people in the world who do this particular thing, and that's right. the thing, yeah. Like, and yeah. it just it strikes me how this this blog and this book has allowed you to really be 
quite like 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 a I don't know a Renaissance astronomer. You know what I mean? Like just, <laughs> just having having a good in depth knowledge about a, a lot of topics in, in astronomy, which is really interesting. Yeah, it's it's really fun because every so often it'll be like, oh, I really have no idea how this works, and then I have to go read a research paper, and it's like, oh, well, I'm reading a research paper. I can't really understand this because this isn't my field, but I can understand it way more than the person that was asking the question. Mm. So um, I can get a lot further with it. And if I get the gist, then that's usually good enough to answer the question that was posed. Right. So can it act like a middle person between the lay person and the expert particular yeah. expert in that particular question? Yeah, basically that's my, that's what I'm trying to do is sort of translate a little bit more between, um, what the technical papers are saying and what the person's understanding is. Um, cause I can, I'm like not an expert in that thing, but I have a lot more background knowledge than the person asking the question. So I can draw on that in a way that they wouldn't be able to. Can I ask another question? Yes. Okay. So this is about like I'm interested to how you how this blog got started. Like I mean, for me, I would worry. I like, put up. I start a blog. Hey, ask me questions about astronomy. Answer your questions. But then, like, what if you what if you make the blog and no one comes? Like, but but obviously you have people. I mean, I don't know how many questions you're getting submitted and how many uh, how often you write blog posts. But I mean, how how did you how did you advertise this in the first? How did you get started? Like how. Yeah, yeah, so I had the same concern. I was worried it was going to crash and burn immediately and that it would just have no questions and there would be no interest and there would, I would have no way of finding the interest and it would just mm-hmm. be dead in the water immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, <laughs> well, I'm asking I started... for the podcast, dude. <laughs> 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 no. Sorry. Go ahead, Jay. I, yeah, so I was, it was, it was a concern. And so I, I decided to, I started it on Tumblr. Because they had a tag system where you could search through the tags and it, there would be a little bit more discoverability that way. Mm. Um, and I got kind of lucky in the first little bit where I had question. Um, I had a question come in pretty quickly after I put up my first post. Um, and then I had um, a question from a friend that I borrowed to put on there and I put up um, and so there was kind of an introductory period of um, maybe two months or so where I was not just getting like I was very slowly getting truly anonymous questions from people I didn't know, but I was also kind of asking friends and family if they had questions to send them to me and that I could use those And then I got questions from people in person sometimes too, if they like knew I was an astronomer and then they'd be like, Oh, I have questions about space. Can you tell me about X thing? Um, and then I could write those up and put them up as well. Um, and then after a couple of months, it started to gain its own kind of momentum, um, and start and people were starting to find it on their own in their own way, however that was. And I think just having tried to regularly or regularly ish, um, update, um, meant that it was getting pushed into these tag feeds a lot. Um, but yeah, honestly, I got lucky at this point. Um, the readership is high enough and people find it from, other posts that already exist. So I get a lot of web traffic for the one side of the moon um, because people are Googling questions. And Mm. then if I have a question on the blog that's similar to that, it'll pop up as like, well, this is similar to the thing that you asked. Um, But now I have quite the backlog of, of questions. So I think I'm at over 500 unanswered questions and there is only one of me. So are the questions um, publicly posted or hmm? can everyone see them? Can everyone see the questions no, you haven't gotten to yet? No, they're pub they're that's a private Google Doc that comes to me basically. Oh, okay. Um Yeah, so the questions aren't public, um, but all the all the ones that I've answered have of been course, yeah. are archived, so um 
and I sort of update the like frequently asked questions one I, where I put up a page of, that just links to the ones that get the most traffic so that people can find those quickly if they want to. Um, mm. So it's the, the one side of the moon question has remained the juggernaut of my website for like three entire years, which was a surprise at first, but the more I think about it, the more I think that makes some, some sense. Well, it's also something I think people have maybe a bit of a misunderstanding, but maybe they learn, like, like for example, people talk about the, the dark side of the moon or the light side of the moon. Right, well, right. there's turn, like, the same side of the moon is not always dark or light. However, yeah. there is a near side of the moon and there is a far side of the moon and that never changes. Right, right. Some people might learn that and be like, whoa, tell me more. And there's probably not that much, you know, available, like, that, that's accessible for the layperson on, online on that particular topic, I would think. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's that's probably true. Or if they do find it, it's like either the rote explanation that they've heard before, or it's really technical and there's not really much in between. Right. No. Yeah. Um, for sure. You're definitely filling so, a space. Clearly, because people keep finding it, so that's fun. <laughs> Super cool. What do for your sure. students think about it? Uh, the students are like, it's interesting. It depends on how old the students are. So the first year students. I'm sure have all found it, but they haven't brought it up. Because um, <laughs> everybody's got a blog. <laughs> well, no, because I think they're they're reluctant to admit how much they Google stalked me before class. Um, <laughs> and so I think that's like I know that they have found my website, and I'm 100 percent sure that they have like probably found my Twitter account, and they have probably found uh, the blog. Um, but they don't want to mention these things because <laughs> they have to admit then that they did all this Google stalking. Um, the older students um, who are like further on in the majors track, they all just know that I have a blog and for the most part and, and a book and most, for the most part, they think it's pretty cool. Um, They're right. I gave the stu- I gave the students an article to read at one point. One of my classes is astronomy in the news. Um, and so I had given the students, a, an article that I was quoted in, uh, partially to see what they would do with that. Uh, and most of them just thought it was really cool that I was quoted in a news article. So I think cool. they have fun with it. All right. Well, I guess we're coming up on the hour. Wait, can I ask her one more question? All right. One last one. one. It's really one cool. It's not question. technical. I'm sorry. Jillian, guess what I'm doing as we're talking? What are you doing as I'm talking? I'm crocheting. Are you still <laughs> oh. into your knitting? That's my question. I, oh, yeah. I haven't done it in a while because I realized I was doing it um, <coughs> mirrored and backwards. And <laughs> <laughs> I had to relearn how to knit. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so I learned, this is a good, a good story, and it's short. So I learned to knit from my mother, who is left-handed, who learned to knit from her roommate, who is not left-handed, but who learned to knit from her Russian grandmother. It turns out Russians <laughs> knit backwards compared to the standard knitting pattern. Oh, interesting. Uh, and in the process of flipping it to a left-handed person and back, it got mirrored and backwards. So my uh, knitting was completely... Like it looked okay, but it was wrong on you had like, so many I, you levels. Had like isomer knitting. You had like yeah. that's really cool. Oh my god! Because I just remember you were before I ever started knitting. You would knit during colloquia and stuff, and I was like, yeah. "That's a good idea." And then I started doing it. <laughs> but you get hate for it sometimes. I don't really know why, but anyways, <laughs> you're not paying attention. I think that was the reason. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now we'll close this up. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Where can people find all your stuff? Um, so the, the blog is at astroquizzical.com. Um, and that has links to most of the other places. So there's links to the book there as well. Um, and uh, if you want to read a slightly technical but not overly technical description of any of my research, that's up on my um professional website which is jillianscudder.com and the book is astroquizzical yeah the book is also astroquizzical yes awesome thank you very much for joining us thank you for having me thanks jillian nice to talk to you (laughs) likewise all right and we're gonna go to a break 
If you like what we're doing and want to help us keep the lights on, go become a patron at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. You can hear the bonus half hour that we record every episode and get a shout out when you support the show. Become a patron for just a dollar an episode at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. Or you can support the show by ordering a t-shirt, mug or other gear from our store at cafepress.ca forward slash brainstorm podcast gear. If you can't afford to become a patron or buy gear, then why not give us a rating or write a review on iTunes or Stitcher? Every rating makes it easier for people to find us. Thanks for your support. We take you now to a conversation being shattered across a hillside. What? I said I'm trying to come up with a promo for this podcast. What podcast? The Geologic Podcast. What? The Geologic Podcast. Oh, Harab's pointless meanderings, sceptical observations, ridiculous musical interludes, and not a hint of geology. Well. All right, maybe a little bit of geology, but it's not worth it. Ah, uh, come on, he's got the religious moron of the week. <laughs> Geo's mom reads Jay-Z lyrics. Pointless. Ask George. Oh, who cares what the bastard thinks? Interesting fauna. Oh, great. The horoscope. Garbage. Not the Bible. Boring garbage. Misinformed science. Stupid garbage. The true adventures of the Philadelphia Funk Authority. Ooh, white Ukrainian boy playing drums in a funk band. Must be fascinating. But none of that is appealing. Not even a wee bit. Great. Don't tune in, then. I won't. Fine. Fine. Great. Oh, great. Fine. Oh, great. Great. You said that already. <laughs> The Geologic Podcast. Pointless, but free. Geologicpodcast.com Feedback. I got an email from Ivan Kelly after my blog for the APA came out on the 17th. uh, Just to let me know that he found our show through that blog and that he is a retired professor from the University of Saskatoon. And that he has done a number of critiques on astrology and the alleged effects of lunar cycles. Interesting. So I will post a link for those Uh. in the show notes as well. And uh, maybe we can cover some of those critiques sometime in the future or uh, maybe even have him on the The show. The alleged effects of lunar cycles. Like like we're saying there aren't any, right? Right. Okay, good. (laughs) I'm pretty confident that there weren't. Yeah. well, there are there are the lunar cycle causes tides. Yeah, sure. Right. right. Well, and then everyone's always like, <laughs> <laughs> so there is an effect. Well, everyone, everyone's like, well, we're made of water, and the ocean gets affected. By therefore, the moon. we're therefore all the crazy shit that happens on the full moon is a real thing. Keep it, keep it, keep it, keep it. Why <laughs> did the tides get affected? Because there's a lot of mass of water, right? And are we massive compared to an ocean? Don't science, Lisa. <laughs> Don't do science. <laughs> Gravity, mass. That's, anyways. This is my widely yes. held socially, social belief. Yes, that's right. We can't, can't science it. Science don't care what you believe, Dave. <laughs> well, my belief doesn't care what you science. <gasps> no, Good kidding. one. <laughs> Mind blown. Says, says the MAGA. Mike drop. MAGA wearing hat people. <laughs> yeah, it says the MAGA hat wearing. Yeah. All right, new patrons. We did not get any new patrons. Uh, a couple. Fuck folks, you, everyone <laughs> listening to this. <laughs> couple <laughs> folks have yeah, to actually yeah. <laughs> lower their pledges. So, uh, and that's fine. Uh, if you want to help us get back up and maybe get to our goal of a hundred dollars an episode, where we can do a pre-show live stream and a video recording of the in-studio session, then you could go and be a patron. Uh, yeah. The goal that we put in place was $100 per episode, and we're currently at 66 You can do it. That That's that's <laughs> that less than 30 grams of weed. Somebody should at episode. least give $3 <laughs> so we can be at 69 right? Like we just, <laughs> well, cool. The trouble is that uh, Patreon takes a cut of your mm. pledge. So if you pledge $3, then we'll only be at 68 So pledge four, people. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I want to thank our top patrons. Destin doesn't suck that much. Daryl Goosen, Aaron Young, William Driver, Positively Skeptical, and, Nat, and the Flying Spaghetti Monster Sauce be upon him. 
Becoming a top patron means you donate at the skeptic level, which is $5 per episode or higher. We have no reviews. And I looked all over. I went to Facebook, Stitcher, iTunes, mul- from iTunes for multiple countries, and Podknife. Did you go to the Botswana iTunes? Not Botswana. <laughs> I didn't go to Botswana. But if, if you're in Botswana and you would like me to read your review on the air... Shoot me a message. <laughs> yeah. I hear we're a hit in Ethiopia. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> just, just pick a random country. Any random country. Yeah. Uh, plug stuff. Dave? Well, I plug things into my cords. And, no, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I don't have much to plug, actually. Tonight there was a screening at the film pool, but I mean, that doesn't matter because it was tonight. Um, Too late now. I don't know that there's anything else. I'm going to have, I mean, I have a music project on the go. I guess I can plug cool. that. I'm not going to say much about it yet, but. It's it's on the go? It's on the go, and we have some songs recorded, so you're probably going to hear something on here at some point. You bet. And, uh, yeah, it's like dark, darker, trap, emo, something. Cool. <laughs> With a female singer, so. Nice. That's all I'll say for now. Lisa? I am not a. Oh, unless you want to come to Old Folks Home and listen to my super religious choir music sometime oh, in December. Which Old Folks Home is that? We actually go to like 10 of them. So. You want on tour. We go on a t- We even do like a tour in, like we go, we have a bus tour where we drive to like small towns and perform at Old Folks Homes in small towns. Oh, that's amazing. It, it's tor- fucking amazing. <laughs> yes. Awesome. That's Between my, my distaste for Christmas music and my, my need to support the people that do things. <laughs> they usually give you date squares. Well, I don't. I don't need date squares. <laughs> I, I will. I will support your Christmas singing from afar. Thank you, Corey. Thank I used you. to sing in a choir. I, I, I can understand the appeal of. It's so it, fucking. It's kind of fun and cheesy. It's so fun and cheesy. I yes. Like, yeah, I can get that. I can. I can understand that. So amazing. <laughs> Especially because right. there's people in the choir that are taking it really seriously too. You know is that I mean? right? Like, oh, there always is. There's always that person. My there's choir is one. very laid back. We're good. We're good people. You sure there's not one person there who's like, this is this is epic. This is like, I'm no, gonna, this no. is life. No, it ain't like that. <laughs> oh, come on. We're, no, we're, we're very You, you gotta have that one. We're too self-deprecating for that. Like, we know okay. we're not oh, the okay. best. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did a blog for the APA. That's the American Philosophical Association, I think. Yeah, that's what it was. Just, just own it. Just own it. It's the APA. Yeah. <laughs> it came out on October 17th. Uh, I am i don't consider myself a particularly strong reader, writer, <laughs> reader or writer. <laughs> <laughs> but <Freudian slip. laughs> it, it felt good. You're saying you didn't read what you wrote? <laughs> yeah. It felt good to actually get something on paper and well, virtual paper, paper and uh, have it out there. Uh, I'm currently working i'll post a link to that in the show notes i'm currently working on a new monthly show with joseph jason noble we're calling it blue collar philosophy uh the first episode was a little disorganized but uh i will get it out soon hopefully and we're recording another episode in about a week and where we're probably going to talk about disaster capitalism and different kinds of violence oh that's a good topic disaster capitalism yeah and I've got a number of interviews lined up over the next little while to talk about things like far-right radicals, extremist groups, and trans people playing sports. Oh, that's that's an interesting topic. Yeah. It's a topic that a lot of people have opinions on. Yeah. But without really, I don't I think, I think without really acknowledging some facts, but. Oh, for sure. They just think it's like men are going to dress up like women so they can be good at the sport. Right. (laughs) <laughs> sure because that's how that works that's how that works yeah <laughs> that's how that's always worked it's, it's just like ladybugs the movie ladybugs you ever seen that one no i don't think i have it's like uh what's his face face old creepy guy comedian um uh, he's dead now roddy dangerfield oh yeah and he like dresses up jonathan brandis as, as a woman or as a girl so that he can play on their soccer team because the soccer team's terrible okay and then suddenly the soccer team's amazing because he played on the team right that's what's going to happen. Everybody saw that movie. Yeah, that's right. Like, that, that's how that works. That's how that works. <laughs> right. Let's cue the outro music.
Wrong outro music. Wrong outro music. <laughs> uh, for all the things Wrong you button. can check out in the show notes on our website, brainstormblog.net, and our hosting page, thebrainstormpodcast.com. Thanks to our financial supporters, Kayla, Janet, Kim, Stephanie, Zach, the Utah, Outca- Utah Outcasts, Will, Aaron, Daryl, Destin Sucks, Bob Glenn, Destin Doesn't Suck That Much, Magnus, several species of small furry animals gathered together in a cave, posited, positively skeptical, Rob, the Podonk Polymath, the Flying Spaghetti Monster, Sauce Be Upon Him, Freethinker215, and Larry. If you want to join them and help the show grow, then you can do that at patreon.com slash brainstormpodcast. Or go buy some stuff at tpublic.com slash stores slash brainstorm dash podcast dash gear. You can join us every two weeks on brainstormradio.net. Our next live show is on November 9th. And I don't actually have a guest lined up. I'm uh, waiting to hear back from someone. And if that falls through, then I'll have to shoot a couple more messages out. The time after that, we will have Dr. Jen Gunter on. So that's fun. I want to give a big thanks to Jillian for joining us. You can find more of her stuff at astroquizzical.tumblr.com. So make sure to check that out. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome, Corey. <laughs> thank you, Dave. And, yeah. th- and thank you, Renee, even though he's not here, uh, for coming tonight. Fuck you, Renee. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Dave, for intro music. Thanks to Aaron Rabbi from Embrace the Void for for doing the voiceover. You can find his stuff at voidpod.com. Thanks to Alex Kemper Murdoch for doing the voiceover for our ads. And thanks to Jason Camo for our outro music. You can find his stuff at a lost state of mind.com. All music played is either with permission or under the SOCAN license to play. For more, inf- for more information on SOCAN, you can ma- check out the music license info page on our website, brainstormblog.net. Remember to give us a rating, a thumbs up, or a fave on your podcatcher of choice. Join our Facebook group, like our page, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our sub- subreddit, sign up for the newsletter, share the show, and spread the word. The more you share, comment, and like our stuff, the more it helps the show grow. Thanks for listening, and remember, the truth matters. is an opinion-based podcast. Each person on the podcast is responsible for their own opinions, and those opinions don't necessarily reflect the views of the rest of the panel. Any guests or anyone associated with the people on the podcast, such as spouses, partners, children, other family members, friends, or employers. No one person speaks for the podcast with the possible exception of Corey, and he doesn't speak for anyone else on the show. The Brainstorm podcast does not represent the views of our sponsors.